little, a little more history before we get to this thing. When Eisenhower becomes president, he's getting all these wild estimates from the CIA, the State Department, the Air Force, the Navy, on what the Soviet long-range bomber force and long-range missile forces are all about. And he's not buying any of it, because none of it's based on observation. So one of the first things we cook up is Project Denifrix. We take cameras attached to balloons and launch them out of Western Europe, 500 of them. Go up into the jet stream. Where have you heard that before? Sail across Siberia and we'll snare them out of the air as they come off the coast of Siberia. We've got 45 of them back. And the general conclusion is we got great pictures of clouds. We got very little usable information. So in 50, May, June 56, we give up on that. And the Soviets are furious because a lot of those balloons are coming down all over the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Because we now have this thing called the U-2. Now, when you want to be someplace, fly someplace you're not supposed to be, you've got three options today. Higher than they can reach, faster than they can catch, or stealthy and they can't see you. The U-2 could fly at 70,000 feet, which was higher than anything the Soviet Union had to shoot it down. It wasn't fast, it only flew about 425 knots. It certainly wasn't stealthy. But the CIA who's doing the flying and the Lockheed who's doing the building knows that eventually the CIA will be, or the Soviet Union will be able to shoot it down, which they did. So they immediately started working on a new plane that could fly 80, 85,000 feet, three times the speed of sound, and would be stealthy. And that project morphed into the SR-71. Okay, the design of the plane is called the Chine design, C-H-I-N-E. To me, it's like almost a couple of pie plates pushed together. There's no vertical surface on this thing that you could bounce radar directly back from. Even these vertical rudders are sloped inward. Everything is sculpted. Now keep in mind, this is 1960s technology. This plane first flew in 64. They painted it with radar absorbing paint, which has little metallic balls in it. They put a radar absorbing material along the leading edges of these two chimes, these two plates as I call them. But it wasn't very strong. The FAA could always pick it up on radar as soon as it came up. It had the radar cross section of a board, they said. But today's F-22 Raptor, our top of the line fighter, stealth fighter, has the radar cross section of a bumblebee. So we've gotten much better at the stealthy part. Because the plane flies so fast, three times the speed of sound, 22, 2300 miles an hour. Heat is your worst problem. Flying in air that's 30 below zero, or excuse me, 50, 60 below zero, the speed of this airplane right around here could be 500, 600 degrees. And 3500 degrees back around the exhaust. So they couldn't use aluminum. So they picked titanium. It's a difficult metal to work with. It required all new machine tools. But there was also another huge problem. Where does titanium come from? The Soviet Union. So the CIA had to set up company, dummy companies, to buy titanium to build the airplane. The heat issue. It has a, the, uh, the fuel that these engines burn, JP73, viscous fuel, it's not even flammable. If we had a bucket of it here, we couldn't even light it until we put an additive in it to fire it. The fuel is used as a heat sink to take heat away from instrumentation before it's burned. The fuel is used for the hydraulic system before it's burned. But the real key to this thing, well, let me, before I get into that, because it can only fly for a couple of hours on a full load of fuel. You have six fuel tanks on the floor and a fuselage, one in each wing. At speed, you can only fly for a couple of hours, you need a tank, or you gotta come down and land. Well, this plane's flying at 80,000 feet, 85, three times the speed of sound. That tanker isn't up there with it. That tanker's down here at 25,000, chugging along at 300 knots or whatever. The plane has to come down, slow down, get behind a tanker, and that coming down and slowing down, it cools off. Well, 
when it cools off, it starts to leak. When you see one of these things parked in a hangar, you can see fuel dripping in different places. Because titanium doesn't fit together too well until you heat it up. So they would always take off with a partial load of fuel. A tanker would come off and top it off and go fly its mission. And once it gets up there and starts flying, all that leaking stops because the thing heats up. Well, when you come down to refuel, here's what happens. This is a picture taken from a tanker. They're pulling the boom away. And you can see the fuel leak, starting to leak out the back of this thing, streaming off the back of it. But it's not flammable until they put the additive in it. The other strange thing that happens is because it flies so fast and heats up, it expands. So it grows about four or five inches in length and three or four inches in width. Now what does that do for all the tubing and plumbing that's in there? I can't imagine. I'm glad my car doesn't do that. But the key to the plane are the engines. These are the only engines we've ever built to run continuously, basically on afterburner, hour after hour after hour. If you can keep fuel in this thing, you can fly this one hour after another after another. But you need those tankers. Because it flies so fast, that cone that you see sticking out of that engine cell, at about 1.3 times the speed of sound, that cone automatically starts to move back in that housing to slow the air down so the turbojet can process the air and mix it with fuel. It has the equivalent almost of a ramjet on the tail end of it, so it's almost a turbojet in front of a ramjet. They say it, it burns less fuel the faster you run it. I can't get my head around that. So we build about 32 of these things. We've lost about 11 in accidents. None of them have ever been shot down. They've been shot at any number of times. We never flew them over the Soviet Union or China. We flew them all around the borders. In fact, one of the guys that does what I do is a training pilot on one of these. And he said it's interesting when you would fly missions, he would, they would fly them out of Mildenhall, England, Beale, California, or Okinawa. And he would fly a mission out of Mildenhall, England, go up around the north coast of Russia. And he'd be up there so far, the tankers couldn't carry him a full load of fuel. It would take three tankers up there. He'd have to come up behind one for a few minutes, take what they could give him, to the next, to the next, because the tankers had to carry fuel for themselves. They used to wear Gemini spacesuits to fly this thing. And they gave them space food to eat. Some of these missions would go 10 hours a month. Well, the, the space food is sort of, you know, mystery food. They're not sure what it is, even though there's a label on it. So they found that if they held it up against this two and a half inch quartz glass here, you know, he and his systems officer, it would heat that stuff up and it would taste a little better. But that glass is hot. So you can't hold your hand up there. So the ultimate solution is a Velcro strip. So one time they put their lunch up there on all of these windows and they're heating things up and then they got real busy flying the airplane and they forgot the lunch and things started to explode. <laughs> this one was given to the museum in 1990. And it sat out in the rain out here off the end of Dulles Airport for several years until they could get it into an enclosure. But the story goes it was coming from Beale, California. They took off from Beale and they always took it off with a partial load of fuel because you'd burn up too much just try to get it all into the air. The tanker tops it off, and then the story goes they gave a phone call to the Smithsonian and say, you better start coming to Dulles because we're going to beat you here to sign the transfer of ownership papers. And in 64 minutes, it was here. Now, I never got any flights out of United in 64 minutes. I don't think any of you did either. If you had fired a 30-06 rifle bullet from the West Coast when this thing left, the plane is here 10 minutes before the bullet. I can't get my head around that. At 13, 14 miles up, they could see 350 miles in any direction. The, the photography was so good, they could tell if it was a man, woman, or child, or a make of automobile, they could tell whether I'm holding something in my hand. Couldn't read it. But they could tell if I had something in my hand. The heat is such a problem, they impregnate the tires with powdered aluminum to dissipate some of that heat. They built what they call titanium vaults right in here for the landing gear to go. 
because they were so concerned that if a tire ever exploded, it might bring the plane down. So it was that titanium bolt would contain any explosion in it. The wheels are good for about 14 flights, the tires. Now you notice the front, the nose wheel has no aluminum. That's because this part of the plane is air conditioned for all the cameras and instrumentation it carries. Any questions, folks? Incredible technology. I can't quote you that, but I asked the guy that flew this thing, and I think he said 3.3 Mach is the best he ever went. 3.35, I think, was the best as he ever went. And, and I don't know what the altitude limit on this thing really is. I'll have to ask him about that. But he said, when you take off with a full, and you get a full load of fuel, you're good for two hours. Then you're looking for that gas station. Should we go look at the shuttle? Not in service. Not in service. They're all out of service.